Hello, everyone. Happy Friday. It's March 31st, end of the first quarter today on the final bar. We'll wrap this week and wrap this quarter. We'll see what happened as risk assets push to the upside. The S&P closing the week above the key level of 4,100. Ladies and gentlemen, this is the final bar. Hello, everyone. Welcome to the final bar. I'm your host, Dave Keller. I'm the chief market strategist here at stockcharts.com in a cloudy Redmond, Washington. Thanks for joining us every weekday after the close as we break down the activity in the markets using the best practices of technical analysis. The Stock Charts platform was started over 20 years ago as a way to empower individual investors, online investors, to make better decisions about their portfolios using the technical toolkit. People like John Murphy, Martin Pring, Larry Williams, Arthur Hill, Tom Boley, Greg Schnell, many, many others, myself and uh, the team at Stock Charts, here to help you uh, empower, uh, be empowered to make decisions, take control of your investments using the technical and behavioral toolkits. End of the quarter is always sort of an interesting time. You have what's called the end of the quarter window dressing, where portfolio managers, uh, a lot of funds have to sort of rebalance things. Uh, you need to make things look nice and uh, polished for the uh, quarterly reports. Then we can go back to some more risky and uh, and different bets uh, starting next week at the beginning of April. We're also setting up for April, which is one of the seasonally strongest parts of the year. So interesting setup as the S&P finally getting above 4,100. We're going to look at all the charts together here, see how the quarter ended up, particularly look at the major averages and how this move to the upside today could uh, be a sign for further strength going into uh, April. Let's get right into our first segment called Wrap the Week. We're going to do a couple different things today as we wrap the week. First, we'll just look at what happened today. As I mentioned, kind of a risk on day. Uh, the second half of the uh, or the afternoon uh, yesterday, moving to the upside, the S&P finished near the highs of the day. Today, sort of picking right up where we left off and pushing to the upside with the NASDAQ leading higher. Let's look at what happened today, and then we'll look at what happened through the course of this week. Then we'll look at some individual charts that I think talk a little bit about underneath the hood, the strength and weakness underneath, uh, underneath the uh, overall market averages and how they performed. The S&P 500, as I mentioned, finishing above 4,100, I think that could be an important thing to pay attention to. As we end this first quarter, with all the uncertainty, all the craziness, the S&P finishing more toward the higher end of the uh, of the range here. Is there enough momentum in, uh, in the month of April and beyond to power through 4,100? I think that's the big question going into next week, but a lot of strength being shown today. NASDAQ leading higher, with the uh, NASDAQ composite up 1.7%, mid caps and small caps up as well. Now, one of the things I talked with, uh, who is it? I think Callie Cox on Wednesday, we talked about the lack of, uh, of participation with small caps. It was sort of like the market moving higher, but it's the mega caps driving it. Today, you actually have a decent participation from the small cap space. The uh, S&P 600 small cap index up almost 2% today. The VIX continuing to push lower. So we talked about how the market's been rallying and the volatility has come back. And that's what we continue to see today. The VIX back below 20 through the course of this week. And before I left on vacation about a week and a half ago, it was... All right, market moving, you know, chopping around, but volatility remains elevated. That sort of suggests uncertainty. This is right after the sort of mini financial crisis. We have banks going under a lot of question marks. We come back, or I come back, and we're looking at the charts. Volatility's come off, market actually moving higher, and the volatility is lessening. So overall, sort of transitioning into what I would probably describe as more of a healthy bull market sort of uh, configuration with breadth indicators per, uh, uh, improving as well. Other asset classes here very uh, quickly, the entire yield curve essentially moving down through the course of the day today. So 10-year yields down uh, a little bit, uh, a little bit to uh, around 350, we'll call it for the 10-year yield, long bond yields around 370. Well, uh, you can see the short end of the curl curve obviously still uh, elevated above four, around 4.6%. So we still have that inverted yield curve, but overall yields have come down. And the reason why that is, or I guess mathematically, is because bond prices are going higher. As we end the uh, first quarter today, both stocks and bonds moving to the upside. The TLT, which is a proxy we use for bond prices, up about 1.5%. The dollar index up about a third of a percent as well. 
Commodities mixed, uh, to, to be honest with you, the commodity ETF, the broad commodity ETF, the DBC was up almost 1%. Silver prices were higher, but gold and copper actually lower. We talked about how gold has emerged as a bit of a safe haven. So while you have risk assets rallying, you don't really need the safe haven of gold or the relative safety of gold. And so gold price is coming off about, about half a percent. The average commodity moving higher today, and crude oil price is certainly moving to the upside, although energy stocks really not doing uh, particularly well today. Finally, cryptocurrencies had actually been mixed earlier in the day, and I was reviewing these first thing in the morning. Actually, Bitcoin was negative Ether as well, but you see both of them have actually rotated to the upside. Bitcoin currently around uh, 28425 Ethereum prices around 1825 so we're not kind of above those key lines in the sand. I'm sort of eyeing Bitcoin 30,000, Ethereum 2,000, sort of those big round numbers. We're not kind of getting above there yet. But we're certainly showing some short-term strength and remaining elevated, right? Not seeing any real pullbacks in those uh, in those crypto markets as well. Just to finish off on what happened today, and then let's take a step back and look at the last week. In terms of sector movements, it was consumer discretionary number one, up almost 3% today. REITs number two, and it's so interesting to me on a week which has seen overall kind of strength in stocks. It's been sort of a risk on field, generally speaking, with uh, the equity markets moving higher, finishing more toward the highs of the week, the S&P getting above 4,100. But real estate is driving the market, uh, has been one of the key sectors moving higher. REITs are a fairly defensive sector, right? REITs are a higher yielding, kind of low volatility, lower beta, more what you'd think of as a more defensive kind of holding place. Uh, if you're uh, if you're not taking on additional risk. So interesting to see consumer discretionary and communication services, kind of two offensive sectors, and then REITs kind of stuck there in the middle, up over 2% again today. On the downside, energy, utilities, consumer staples, all up, but up less than 1% and underperforming the S&P uh, going into the uh, the end of the week. Let us look here at the wrap the week chart. So what we like to do is just look at the last five trading days and look at where we started and where we ended, right? So this is starting the clock at last Friday's close, taking to where we're at today. And let's see what happened. The black line, which is kind of this one right here, uh, is up three and a half percent. That's the S&P 500. So stocks having a pretty decent week. And again, among uh, certain weeks where, where where stocks have been sort of flat to down, this is certainly a nice, a nice recovery uh, sort of move, a nice demonstration of strength going into the end of the quarter. So again, the S&P finishing the week up about three and a half percent. There are a number of things that were pretty close within a rounding error of the S&P. And, and very quickly, uh, we have the NASDAQ 100 up 3.2 percent uh, in blue. This is actually Bitcoin, which was almost identical to the S&P's return over the last uh, seven calendar days. And then in purple, we have small cap stocks, which were up 3.8 percent. So all of those up about the same amount, about three and a half percent for the week underperforming the S&P through the course of the week. Emerging markets finished positive, but only by about 2%, so underperforming the S&P's 3.5%. Gold, uh, in red, we have uh, bond prices, and in green, we have the US dollar all down for the week. So it was sort of equities and crude oil up, gold, dollar, um, bonds actually finishing the week uh, in the negative. This up here, by the way, is up 9%. This is the crude oil uh, ETF. The USO matches pretty well, particularly in a short-term time frame, about a week. It matches up very, very well with crude oil, uh, the crude oil future. Um, so crude oil price is certainly surging to the upside. This is a supply issues uh, news from Iraq about uh, oil prices, certainly moving things higher. Interesting to see, though, that energy stocks, even with crude oil prices moving higher, you're not really seeing that matched with uh, with a rally in energy stocks. Big integrated names, uh, E&P stocks overall, not doing particularly well this week, particularly on a relative basis. So worth noting, it's kind of crude oil working, but energy not really being dragged up uh, along with that performance. Now let's finish off our Wrap the Week segment, just looking at what happened through the course of this week. You know, when I'm looking at uh, the Menomina stocks, these are sort of those mega cap uh, you know, uh, Fang-like names, uh, things like Microsoft and NVIDIA and Apple. You know, I can't help but pointing out, again, NVIDIA, the top-ranked stock right now in our entire large-cap universe. This is the stock chart scooter rankings. It's a proprietary trend-following um, model, uh, which we we actually uh, disclose all the details of it. If you uh, click on the little uh, magnifying glass and look for SCTR, uh, and uh, you'll find some articles talking about the scooter rankings. They combine three different time frames. It's meant to sort of demonstrate the overall strength, more uh, leaning toward uh, long-term uh, trends than short-term trends. It's more of a longer-term gauge of trend strength. But out of all of the large cap universe in the US, NVIDIA currently the top ranked stock. And it's interesting, it's making another new swing high today, right? Finishing the week 
uh, in a position of strength, making a new, uh, uh, looks almost like a 52-week high, not quite, but really, really close. So NVIDIA continuing to push higher. Again, basic Dow theory, uptrend is a series of higher highs and higher lows, and a chart like NVIDIA looks like that. Others, uh, sorry to get back to this one, something like uh, we'll look at a uh, Meta, for example, maybe we'll look at Netflix. Um, Meta also in the top 2% of all uh, large cap stocks, again, making a new swing high today. We can also look at Microsoft. We can look at Apple. So all of these finishing the week to a new swing high, making a new high for the year. And the reason why that's important is if you're wondering why the benchmarks are doing so well, it's because of those eight stocks, what I call the phenomena stocks, all doing pretty well at the moment, right? So when those names are working, there's so much cap represented in those mega cap tech consumer communication services um, uh, stocks that the major benchmarks are going to do pretty well. And, and certainly the NASDAQ, which is dominated by some of those uh, names that I'm highlighting. So I think the strength in the FANG stocks is really translating to the strength in the overall benchmarks. Even though there are plenty of stocks that are participating just fine, it's really the mega cap names that are driving things. Now, what is the move that we've seen this week? And again, sort of a nice move to the upside. What is it doing to things like the market trend model, which we follow? Here we see the market trend model on three timeframes. This is a model that I created uh, and, and, and started using years ago to try to identify the market uh, trend on three different timeframes. Long term is still bearish, but slightly, slightly narrowly so. It's really, really close to being bullish, but just a, a just a hair below zero. I don't have a neutral setting, but if I did, it would probably best be described as neutral, but overall still technically bearish. The rally this week has put the medium term model firmly in the bullish sign and the short term model for, firmly bullish as well. So very quickly with the recovery that we've seen over the last uh, you know, eight to 10 uh, business days, uh, we're seeing, uh, for me, the long-term model is very close to bullish, but short-term and medium-term certainly saying strength. So at this point, it's telling me risk on is a pretty safe place to be. It's a focus on uh, identifying strong stocks. And again, it's some of those groups like technology, the semiconductors in particular that we've highlighted recently that continue to show strength. Just to finish off here, I'll notice it's not all perfect, right? So if you look at the bullish percent index for the S&P 500, still below 50%. So uh, most stocks in the S&P still not giving a buy signal on their point and figure chart. It's a little more of a lagging indicator. It takes a little more recovery to really trigger that. I did want to point out over 50% as of today's close, just over 50% of the S&P back above their 50-day moving average. About a week ago, that was down in the 20, 25% range. So it's been a nice recovery with a lot of individual names, the S&P 500 itself as well, all going back above their 50-day moving average. So good things happen when charts are above their moving averages. We're seeing that with breadth indicators. We're seeing that with the major averages overall, telling us we're now uh, you know, potentially setting up for strength going into April, one of the seasonally strongest months of the year. Let's take a quick commercial break. We'll be back answering your questions from the Final Bar Mailbag. We'll see you in a minute. Hey, everyone. Welcome back to the Final Bar. Thanks so much for joining us every weekday after the close as we share an update on the markets using the lens of technical analysis. Such a brilliant way of improving what I call your situational awareness, your awareness of what's happening in the markets. A lot of interesting moves today with uh, with risk assets moving higher. I always tell people to put a bit of an asterisk on the last day of the quarter. This is that window dressing phase where things usually look a little artificially more constructive than they may be. Next week, will be sort of the return to normal sort of move. So let's see what happens and if there's a reset after the rally that we've seen. But so far, again, based purely on the charts, nice way to finish the uh, the month of March and finish the first quarter. A couple quick announcements before we continue on with the final bar mailbag. First off, we welcome your questions. The mailbag is all fueled by questions from people like you just trying to use charts and trying to get help doing so. We're here to help you along your way. You can email us your questions at the final bar at stockcharts.com. We're on Twitter at final bar SCTV, and we're on YouTube. Put a comment below the video you're watching on our Stock Charts YouTube channel. We'd love to hear from you. We'll hope to answer your question in our next mailbag, which will be Monday's show. Upcoming schedule on Monday. We have another mailbag. It's also my birthday and our producer, Sky Boggs. Both of us, for some strange coincidence, have the same birthday, and it's this coming Monday. So happy birthday to us. We will be here providing a fantastic birthday edition of The Final Bar and answering your questions in the mailbag. Tuesday, April 4th, we have Chris Shivako. Chris is a fantastic guest, really thoughtful, long-term approach to using charts and technical analysis. He's the Chief Investment Officer of Shivako Capital Management in Atlanta. We'll hear from him on Tuesday, April 4th. Let's continue on our show today with the final bar mailbag. Keep your great questions coming and let's get to question number one. 
Dave, I noticed that the McClellan oscillator turned positive. What do you make of it? I love that question. And thanks so much for, for noticing that. You know, we've talked a little bit about uh, breadth indicators. And it's funny, while I was on vacation, uh, I don't know uh, how much um, Julius de Kempner, my guest host, was talking about some of the breadth indicators. It's interesting how much many of them rotated from, you know, very bearish to uh, very much not so bearish from negative to almost, uh, you know, net positive in a big way. Um, some of them less optimistic, or I guess less, you know, less raging bullish, I would say the advanced decline lines, the raw advanced decline data, not quite confirming uh, a new swing high just yet. But if you look at the McClellan oscillator, if you look at the bullish percent index, if you look at new highs and new lows, these breadth indicators are all showing strength. What's interesting is, uh, you know, we were talking earlier this week with a couple of my guests about the narrow leadership in the markets, right? The S&P pushing higher, but the problem is it's a relative, it felt like a relatively narrow group of stocks that were really leading the way. And it's what I call the Menomina stocks or the FANG stocks, right? These are the ones doing well, the Microsoft, Apple, NVIDIA, uh, Meta, Netflix, these are the charts that are really starting to work. And there's such big names in key sectors that they're able to single-handedly drive the indexes higher and certainly a lot of ETFs as well. Here's the thing though, breadth indicators like the McClellan Oscillator are trying to minimize that bias of just looking at the biggest stocks, right? The S&P is dominated and a lot of ETFs are dominated by a couple big mega cap names. The McClellan Oscillator and most breadth, most breadth indicators, one of the benefits is that they are equal weighted, right? So they're not weighting based on large or small companies, large or small market cap. They're just looking at uh, a number of stocks or counting the numbers of names with a particular uh, situation. So the fact that the McClellan Oscillator has rotated back above zero tells you that not just the mega cap names, but overall, what are the average stocks doing? Are they rotating higher or lower? And the fact that it's above zero basically tells you that it's stronger over weaker. And again, if you look back in these green shaded areas, over the last 12 months, you can see it's been a rising price environment, right? It's been a bullish phase. Now, there's no guarantee that this doesn't go for, you know, a couple more days and then rotates back lower. It's not telling you a particular upside objective for the S&P. It's just telling you the conditions right now. And the conditions right now are broadly positive. And I, that's what I would make of the fact that it's gone above zero. Uh, you know, when I look back, I'm happy uh, suggesting that the market's moving higher when the uh, when the McClellan oscillator is above zero. Because again, you look back and you look over the last 12 months when that's happened, these have been pretty good rallies. So what does this tell me? Number one, trend is up in the short term. Number two, look for if and when the McClellan oscillator goes back below zero. That is usually the end of these rally phases. And it's not been too late, right? If you wait for the McClellan oscillator to go back below zero, you're not missing much of the sell-off, but it's a really good time to sort of uh, reduce risk and uh, bet on at least some sort of uh, retrenchment back move to the downside. Great question, by the way, and thanks for bringing up that chart. Next question. Why are there not many breadth indicators for industries? It would be great to have more indicators like bullish percent indexes, advanced decline lines. And in your question, you actually mentioned a number of other uh, breadth indicators as well. It's a really good question. Uh, and, and here's the answer. So the short answer is, um, <clears throat> the problem is the smaller your universe, right? So if you're looking at the S&P 500 or the NASDAQ 100 or the Russell 1000, that's a lot of stocks, right? So if you're looking at the percent of stocks with a certain characteristic, or if you're counting advancers minus decliners, if you have 500 names to, to draw from, you can actually have a lot of nuances, right? Because a couple of names will be rotating and you can, you can actually draw a lot of great conclusions when those values change. But if you only have 10 stocks in a sector, right? Um, like the old telecom sector only had a couple S&P names in the telecom sector. So an advanced decline line with like three stocks is kind of useless, right? Because you're basically going from 33% to 66% to 100% and you're making these big jumps. So we do have things like bullish percent indexes for some of those sectors and industry groups. I'll show you where they are. If you go to charts and tools and on the right side, go to market summary and sorry, a couple steps here, click on table view. It's a little easier to see. If you go down a little bit, you'll find a bunch of different ETFs, bonds, commodities, cryptos, currencies, market breadth. These are some of the most commonly used breadth indicators, and you'll see that they have generally broad universes, right? The NYSE, the NASDAQ, um, you know, uh, the S&P 500, these are our broad groups of stocks because it's easy to measure breadth when you have a lot of uh, a big uh, sample size, basically. The bullish percent indexes, we get into smaller groups like the Dow 30, like gold miners, uh, like transportation. This is a relatively small number of stocks. 
the 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 caution I would I would uh, urge you to use is if you're looking at a small number of stocks, these numbers can jump very very quickly, and it's less of a big signal. Right, something goes from twenty percent to eighty percent. That just might mean that there are four names and a couple of them rotated. And so I found when you have a smaller group, breadth indicators are less uh, useful because we tend to assume that a big swing means something big. And it might just mean you're not looking at enough of, a, of a observations. And so a, a big change in one of those industries would cause the entire thing to rotate very, very quickly. That's why we don't do breadth indicators on smaller groups of stocks. That's why you keep it pretty broad, because the idea is you can do that. The other thing I would say is if you're looking at a smaller group of stocks like utilities or telecoms or gold miners, you can look at 10 individual stocks and have a pretty good sense of what's happening, right? The the point of breadth indicators is to aggregate and not have you have to look at 500 individual stocks. It's trying to make it easier. With a small group of stocks, you can look at the individual stocks and I think learn the conclusions already. Next question, the yield curve has had a massive rise in the last five days. What does this turnaround mean? And I apologize for not getting this question yet. You actually sent this question a little little while ago and and and, and actually the conditions have changed. It's actually uh, uh, changed quite a bit since you first asked that question. To answer your question, I'm gonna use the dynamic yield curve to get to this. This is a fantastic tool, by the way. Go to charts and tools. On the right column, you'll see the dynamic yield curve. This is a simple but very powerful visualization that shows the relationship between the yield curve on the left to the S&P 500 on the right. This is the way that the yield curve works. You're looking from the short end, short duration, three months, down to the long end, right? Long bonds, 20-year, 30-year bonds. And these are basically the uh, current rate, the current interest rate on the treasury bonds uh, going across that. Now, the whole point of this visualization is to click on a particular point in time. This is using weekly data going way back for years and years, and you can see what the yield curve looked like. A normal yield curve looks kind of like it did in mid-2021, where the short end is very low, the long end is very high. That is a normal yield curve. What we see right now is an inverted yield curve where the short end is higher than the long end. What that essentially means is that investors are pricing in weakness in the economy. And so they're betting on interest rates going down. They're betting on the economy to uh, not grow or to shrink. And as a result, making long-term bets on the economy, not ideal. And so you sort of unwind those and that causes an inverted yield curve. Now, what you can also do on this visualization is make the trail length a little bit longer. And what that does is if I go back a little bit, we can see uh, a couple of days ago, this is where the yield curve was over a two week period. And you can see it overall was moving lower. When you asked your question, it was actually doing the opposite, moving higher. The yield curve has fluctuated quite a bit in the last couple of weeks. A lot of that has to do with the sort of mini banking crisis uh, with a couple of banks going under, UBS, Credit Suisse, all of that sort of thing. This caused a lot of dislocation in the uh, in the bond markets. Also, when things get uh, when investors were getting nervous about instability, they bought a lot of uh, bonds. Buying a lot of bonds pushes the price up, brings yields down a little bit, uh, and so as a result, the yield curve has fluctuated quite a bit. I would personally be paying less attention to that uh, overall movement in the yield curve and more with the shape of the yield curve and particularly what it means about stocks versus bonds. Overall, an inverted yield curve is the market pricing in uh, lack of economic growth going forward. Look for a normalization of the yield curve to uh, you know, signal more that investors are pricing in economic growth. That is what a bull market recovery would most likely start to look at. Inverted yield curves, as we know, usually line up with uh, recessionary periods. Probably our final question, how do I display charts inversely, like your charts of bonds and the VIX? Yeah, one of the charts in my Mindful Investor Live chart list, I love this chart, is looking at um, high yield spreads. And I like to look at charts inverted. And this is a, a, a trick that I learned in my Fidelity days. One of the things we would do would be to flip charts upside down. And I'll, I'll, I'll take a step back. If you're looking at a chart of Home Depot, the problem as a technical analyst, the longer you do this, is if I if you covered up the ticker and showed this chart, I I might guess it's Home Depot, particularly big stocks like Home Depot and Apple and Tesla. You look at the chart so often, you kind of know them cold. Like we're, you don't even need to see them to know what the chart looks like. So covering up the ticker doesn't help you a whole lot. So one of the tricks you can do is invert the scale. And what that does is it's the same chart, it's just flipping it over. And as a result, it kind of helps to disconnect from the dynamics of the trend from the history of that particular stock and helps you just focus on the price characteristics, right? What are the prices telling you about the overall conditions here? 
So the way that you invert any chart on uh, the stock charts platform is just put the little minus sign right before um, the uh, the ticker. So HD would be Home Depot. Minus sign HD would just be inverted scale. So on that chart that I just showed you, the high yield chart that you asked about, which is here, all I did to create this chart is I put a minus sign before the ticker of the high yield uh, OAS, which is a high yield index option adjusted spread. I did the same thing for the VIX. So you can see minus sign, dollar sign VIX, which is basically the VIX index, but I want to flip it over. The ACP platform, by the way, also has the ability to invert charts and invert scales. Our newer version of stock charts, what we're calling or sharp charts, what we're calling sharp charts 3.0, which is due out later this year. Uh, we're going to add some more flexibility, more opportunities to do so, a little more complex mathematical tools uh, with your chart. So we've got a lot of really cool plans with it. But for now, that is a great way to invert a chart. If you want to take an economic series or a data series and flip it over, it's a great way to do that. But also an interesting way to take a chart that you know, flip it over and see if you think the opposite, analyzing the chart and the technical indicators that are related to it. That is a wrap for the show. We've got to wrap the day with the three and three. Let's talk about three charts in three minutes that tell the story of this market environment. Here's chart number one. This is the end of the first quarter. Congratulations. We survived it. We've made it. Let's think about what actually happened over the first three months of this year. The dollar index is essentially flat for the year. This is the UUP ETF finishing the first quarter only up about a quarter of a percent. So interesting when you think about how the markets have actually improved in 2023 so far. The fact that the dollar has been essentially a non-factor has certainly given space for some of those risk assets to move higher. Up here in the 75 to 8% positive range, we have gold and bonds and stocks. They're all having similar returns in the first quarter, all in that 75 to 8% range. So when you think about the S&P testing 4,100 and closing above there today, you think about what this means for risk assets going forward. Recognize that stocks and bonds and gold all had a similar return in the first quarter, all up about 75 to 8%. The worst performer out of these five ETFs that I'm showing is crude oil. This is the USO ETF, which actually finished down five and a half for five and a quarter percent. What's interesting is a couple of weeks ago, it was down over 15%. So it's recovered quite a bit here in the last uh, in the last couple of weeks. Let's get to chart number two. Um, one of the charts that Dave Landry showed on our show yesterday, and I kind of glossed over it because I ran out of time, but I just wanted to reinforce one of the points that I think he he made very, very well. This is a chart of the S&P 500 uh, going back to the beginning of last year, beginning of 2022. And I have a horizontal line basically right around the current prices as I was uh, preparing this earlier in the day. It's right around the 4,100 level. Look to the left and see how much time we've spent at the same level. Um, Tom Boley and I were talking months and months ago about the bottoming process in the S&P. His conjecture back here in June it was this was the bottom, even though it might not be the actual price bottom, we are now in a bottoming phase and it's going to take some time to do it. And so far, it's hard to argue with that general approach to how to interpret the price action in the last six months, right? We are at 4,100 and we've been at 4,100 many, many times going back to May and even uh, we were almost there in February of last year. So while the market has had a lot of noise, while it's had a lot of fluctuation, directionally, we have really been in a consolidation phase for quite some time. This is what a bottoming period really looks like. The way you get out of a bottoming period is you get strength from new leadership names and that's what we're not quite seeing yet. However, this is the chart I would use to do it. This is a chart looking at new swing, sorry, not new swing highs, new 52-week highs and 52-week lows on the New York Stock Exchange and the S&P 500. I'm seeing no red in the last week, and I'm seeing a lot of green. The more green on this chart, the more leadership names are getting to a new 52-week high. A bull phase in April would need to see more and more green on this chart. Folks, that's a wrap for this week and a wrap for the final bar. Thank you so much for joining us through the first quarter, and certainly today. All of our previous interviews and episodes are at StockChartsTV.com. For Stock Charts in Redmond, Washington, I'm Dave Keller. Have a great weekend. We'll see you on Monday. Hey guys, Dave Keller here with StockCharts.com. Thanks so much for watching our video. If you enjoyed it, and we hope you did, hit the like button right below. Also, we have so much new content every day. Consider subscribing to the channel. Just hit the subscribe button in the video or right below. Thanks for watching. Stay safe. Have a fantastic day.